the check in. Right. So this is the temperature plot, so all the plots are going to look very similar with the red line being the current year, the black line being the 20 year average, and then the rainbow colored lines being all the years in between, just so you can see year to year variations with that average line, and how the current year got stacked up to those variations. So in the temperature, uh, we started out below average, it was actually cold this spring, didn't warm up super quick. Which is nice to get that media hatch, which led to things starting a little bit later, as we'll see later on. Through the June and July months, you'll see this little flat spot. As John talked about, it's really difficult for us to get out. This is during the switchover, you know, the co op was replacing their boat ramp. There were some other boat issues that we had, so we were able to make a run in June, uh, which you heard July, which you can see this data right here. But for the most part, you can infer that the temperature was going to be above average uh, for most of the summer and fall months. And then the really key interesting part right here in October is we did this real quick switch from above average temperature to below average temperature uh, through late October and November and December. So it turned out really cold really quick. Uh, moving into salinity, you can see that we started out really high this year in that red line well above the observed maximums from previous years. Got very little inflow during the springtime. Didn't drop out a whole lot until like April when there was more rain than the river inflow. Steadily increased through the summer months uh, up until about September, October. Likely when the irrigation season stopped, we started to see that inflow, started to get some winter storms, and things have dropped off slightly. Uh, one of the things I want to highlight here is in November and October, you'll see these two numbers. So the 18.5 is all 15 sites average. That's dominated by one site that was 4%. So if you remove that 4%, we were 19.5. Uh, same thing in December, that one site went to 1%. So that's just showing we're picking up that river inflow there. So that's what this plot would look like without that 4% and the 1%. You can see how that line is flat and down the state. So looking at the chlorophyll data, again, uh, we started out really low early January, February. Uh, likely this was a nitrogen input problem. And so we got some of that you know, early spring rain, more than the river flow, process of nitrogen, increased our phytoplankton, it needed to be grazed off. Rebounded, crashed again. That's going to play into our cis production plot that we'll look at next. But we can say that we saw that just flat through the summertime, not a lot of rebounds, very low food throughout the summer. And then a fairly quick rebound through October. And then this kind of interesting little drop right here in late November, early December. And that's going to be tied into kind of this whole cascading effect of, that we'll see. As we move past into the other demographics, we'll get to that. So just confirm that that whole point there. Uh, looking at the cis densities, so here again, everything was kind of suppressed. We started our cis production a little bit earlier than the average this year, and this right here, June, July, is not the earliest cis production we've seen. It's on this purple line here, starting about June, but really, cis production just started early this year. They've gone through that starvation cycle like they needed to so kind of trigger that. It was really hot, it was really salty, and they were just hedging their bet on, I don't think why the going to survive, so let's put it all in this production. So that started early. Uh, the cyst drops there in September, likely that was a hatch of some of that summertime egg. I know we discussed at the last meeting that the diet pods were not real strong, and we weren't real sure how, how the quality of those cysts was going to be, but it does look like they hatched. Uh, with some of that early fall rain. Um, and then this can kind of continue to rebound. And then with a slight dip again here from that November, December time frame, you see that just dropping off of cis production. So let's talk about that. So getting looking at the Nauplia numbers, again, because of that like warm spring, we just we waited so long before everything hatched. We really didn't pick up our first heat. Part of this is a data resolution error. We couldn't make it out. We didn't sample. Thoroughly early enough, so we may have missed something, but it doesn't look like it just because all of the peaks are suppressed and all that huge time frame and the food rebound and everything really got started. The interesting part that you'll 
we'll know that here in kind of that late October, early November, at least we made our knock on home today. Um, we started picking up what's called the knock gap. So they started this late generation. And that's going to play. We see that in the juveniles, uh, similar pattern, suppressed in the gym before they started really peaking. And then we did this extra roll bump in November. Uh, that carries through to our total adults. Adults, again, that really late table peak. And then this extra roll bump moving into more of like that late November as it's time for those juveniles to reach the adult stage. That's going to explain that chlorophyll drop because that generation needed the food, there was plenty of food for them. And so when you look here in the upper right hand corner with the egg density versus the lower left corner, which is the cyst density for females producing those two different types of uh, product, you can see that they actually switched back to egg production in late November. That's not typical, but it makes sense when you look at all the different factors going in, high food, salinity was releasing, temperature was starting to drop. They got a few a few environmental cues that maybe it's time and maybe the world's not having it. Some of these little bit of stress relief is kind of the case. So, so a little bit after the live production, a little bit less in the cis production, but overall they still had a pretty decent amount of time to produce the cis, so it looks like there's still some products out there. I didn't mention the current Cis uh, numbers that were released to the industry today, uh, it's 127 as of yesterday. So that's looking good for now. Maybe a little bit on the high side for this time of year. Kyle, is, is that, did you have outliers that no you could have? No outliers. So it was a good clean run, but 127. So okay. we're still going. That, I'm wondering if the uh, that drop in chlorophyll that you know it was a really long period during the summer. I'm wondering if that's temperature related as well. It could be, but I also suspect that it's due to our sampling periods where there was that section in June and July where we couldn't make it out. Do we have a similar I think you guys, Yeah, I've got it built into my plot. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> and it's low. It's low, huh? Yeah. So, will you, Brian, biologists biologist, explain to me the, um, with the, I always thought of it as sort of a temperature signaling for diapause, but um, I know there's lots of environmental conditions. That are involved in that shift. So, if anytime there is sort of a stress sensor um, that goes off that says, let's do this, yeah, is it so sort of some of them will, sort of stress? yeah, they'll, they'll kind of put that, they'll hedge that back. Okay. So some combination of stressors. Uh -huh. I mean, in this, this case, you probably had food stress, temperature stress, and salinity yeah. stress combined, yeah. yep. which could have, I know from some lab experiments that, you know, even with nitrogen injection and sort of getting that low oxygen stress as a result. Mm -hmm. It could also uh, induce this well production. Yeah. yeah, and some of the so, factors that isolated in laboratory experiments for triggering this production tend to co-occur out on the lake just in time of year. It can be right. you know, day length oxygen, food concentration. Those things time. all overlap, so it's a little bit hard to tease apart from the field data. Yep. Well, I'm going to point out there's another stressor that we've identified. And that is <clears throat> the females tend to produce cysts not just at the higher salinity, but more cysts than you would expect at that salinity if in their lifetime they've experienced an increase in salinity over their life. So it's not just what the salinity is, ah. it's whether it's increasing or over decreasing their lifetime. over their lifetime. Which, ah. which we've seen it increasing pretty much all year. Yeah. Well, all year it's been it's yeah, going up. Yeah. Going up yeah. Yeah. yeah, with that burn going in and then uh, the mixing of the deep brine layer, I think it was probably <clears throat> exacerbated by, or the increase in salinity was exacerbated by that. 
Did you ever get that stir bar on the bottom of the <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm working on it. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, we wanted to whack it once because Jim was getting tired. I think the wind is worse. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um,
Uh, but we got uh, an added uh, variable in this. The burn was raised, influencing how water is moving back and forth. Uh, so there's a couple variables in play here in addition to the initial. I think bike work hasn't been in that direction on both ends. So we're getting earlier peaks on runoff and later. Uh, it seems like we're squeezing everything in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we need to do a publication on, on that very thing. And we, we are working on a publication for UGS. Uh, they're going to do a new great public compendium kind of publication, right? Uh, I think the last one was in 2002. Um, what we're going to talk about like levels to give a perspective on what's going on and, and inflows at our basis. So we are going to publish something on this for the record so that 25 years from now, um, that will be very helpful to people as they watch what's happening very publicly. Uh, so, lake elevations of, on the north end of the lake, right? We have a gauge that's been running since 1966. Uh, we call it the Great Salt Lake near San Luis Utah. So I'm showing data starting in 2016 up to the present time. And first thing you notice is in 2016, this was the a uh, uh, new historical level for this for this gauge. Next is the north arm was cut off. They closed the culverts. So there was no flow from south to north. Lake level for the north arm declined, and we, we reached a new historical level about 4189. These are average data values. Uh, looking at the more recent data, like this is gauge, you see we've broken that record. <laughs> so this is the you know, we're just setting records. So as of yesterday, we were reporting on uh, 88.6 at that uh, gauge, and it's clear that we're in record low territory. So um, there you go. Any questions? That's the North Arm story. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the uh, discharge uh, inflow gauge location. So here I'm showing a cubic flow plot. The units are in millions of acre feet on the y-axis. It's a log scale. And we have a water year, October through September, shown on the x-axis. The bold black line is the current water year. The blue line is the uh, highest ever measured cumulative flow. The green zone is the uh, 26 to 75th percentile range. And the orange is the lowest ever measured cumulative flow. So now looking at the whole black line for the current water year, you can see we're on that orange line. So we're high for you know at this point in the water year, uh, it's the lowest observed cumulative flow. It's early on, it's all about the snowpack. We'll see how things shake out, but this is the current status. Uh, on the right, I'm showing the total flow of the four sites that I'm going to show you here. Um, for water years 22 and water years 2021, we'll talk a little bit more about, more about that today, which is really a heads up on what that total that means. This is uh, our other, so our second gauge, Great Salt Lake at Marmington Bay Outflow. Um, same exact type of plot. The bold black line, once again, is really basically you know, on top of the orange line for the lowest cumulative flow. So um, it's again all about the snowpack and, and the type of runoff. Uh, hopefully, we end up in the green zone at least um, uh, by the end of the water year. Here's Weaver River, Plain City, exact same type of plot. Here, at least, the uh, bold line is uh, within the 25th to 75th percentile, or about the 25th percentile uh, uh, ranking uh, for this point in the water year. So, um, uh, I just Man, I just would love to end up on the, on the, the, the gray line in the green zone with the median. Uh, it would be wonderful to at least uh, end up there. So we'll see how this is going. This gauge is directly funded by uh, the Deep John Lump and the Deep Systems uh, Program, the Gaga Drain. Um, exact same type of plot, the old black line is right on that gray line, the median value uh, at this point in the year. So in water year 2021, if you add the flows up for all, for sites, we have about 708,000 acre feet. Water year 2022, about 780,000 acre feet. So the big question mark is where we're we going to land this year. This data is all available to you guys on the web. This is from WaterWatch USGS. This is a WaterWatch website. These plots are very easy to, to create. Um, so um, I just encourage you to, to 
keep tabs on uh, flows. Uh, this is one tool you have at your fingertips for keeping tabs on cumulative flows very easily. The other uh, uh, discharge maintenance we make are the Bear River Bay outflow bridge, so the railroad causeway, so the Bear River Bay, uh, enters into the Great Salt Lake. We have to make periodic discharge maintenance at this site. We tried to run a stream, stream gauge there years ago. Um, it did not work out. Um, the, the sediment uh, situation kept knocking equipment out. Uh, there's, there's a list of reasons why we weren't able to keep a gauge going there long term. But we make uh, management at, at this bridge location to collect samples for nutrients. Um, and we shoot for um, seven to ten or eight to ten samples a year. Uh, in the summertime months, the, there's no, there's essentially no flow there, right? Uh, all the water from the river is uh, utilized elsewhere. Um, and so we don't have discharge maintenance. The last one we have on the site uh, was made in uh, May 17, 2022. Uh, was a 390 CFS at that point. Um, so now our goal is as flows are now coming up, or you know, in October the flows start to come up. So it's time for us to uh, focus on making these periodic discharge ratings engaged. And the whole idea here is to look at the comparison between the discharge ratings at this site and the current engage where we have a continuous discharge uh, location uh, to see if we can build a robust. Uh, regression. Um, so we're going we're to continue that, and it's important that we continue to collect samples at this site uh, for, for nutrients. It's the closest point to Green Salt Lake. So if you're talking about nutrient mass balance in the south arm, uh, you know you want to get the inflows as close to the lake as possible for your sample. Uh, so we'll continue to do this. We're going to hit it hard now for the remainder uh, through, through the remainder of our agreement with the job the ecosystems program funds us directly. So this is another part of our work with, with the ecosystems program. Uh, Brian, yes. I know they had uh, talked about putting gauges on Bear River's uh, outer. Is that still? Uh, yes. So there's another bridge north of this bridge that we call the Mineral Court Bridge um, that right now the lake goes below. And there's some new, newer technology uh, for measuring water velocity that are non contact. You don't have to submerge them if you can not do a bridge in the middle of town. Um, so we purchased that equipment, those non contact surface velocity sensors. Uh, we have two of them, they're pretty expensive. We purchased them, and we are going to try to operate a gauge at the mineral core bridge. Um, we're not entirely sure it's going to be successful. The water surface has to have a certain roughness for these sensors to provide good surface velocity data. Um, I'm going to be working the state with the U.S. You know, you are called for the state of lake legislation, USGS, Senator Romney, a senator from Oregon. I'm working my channels to try to uh, have them fund the effort to install the equipment, start collecting data. Uh, but in the future, we're going to be looking for cooperators to help run from the gauge. So we're going to see if we can make things work there first. And if we're successful getting engaged, so then we're talking discharge values under 15 minutes, and if we get a beautiful thing, we'll have a much better handle on how much water from the river river is actually making it to the river bay and very solid. Ryan, you yeah. can say this after you don't just say it now, but it would be great to have an update on um, since the saline lake still passed in the Senate. And um, and it passed in the House. Is there going to be a conciliatory process where they try to pull those together? And and I assume uh, your office will be receiving some of those funds. And is there a proposal situation you'll go through? We can just fill us in on that function today. That'd be great. What you know about it? Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Christine is um, dialed in on that. Our obviously our director now for the Utah Water Science Center. Mm -hmm. By the way, that's David O'Leary.
Okay, moving on here. Um, so we are doing a lot of monitoring for what we call so called new breach, others call it less crash. Anyway, it's, it's still a new breach in my mind, right? So this is where all the map exchange for salt and water happens between the north and the south arm. We make monthly discharge maintenance there, so manual maintenance. There's a picture of someone taking a discharge maintenance. Um, we have lake elevation sensors located there, we have weather sensors, we have an upper velocity meter. And we're coordinating all this, this work with USU, who are working on the American model for the flow that this site is a whole different modeling approach to actually. So, this data uh, is being used directly to help get these models calibrated on the moon. This group is not me, this is historian, is not paying for this, but I like to update you all on this because it's such an important site. Here's discharge in cubic feet per second time from 2016 to, to roughly current, uh, shown on this plot. Um, blue circles are the bi directional flow site most of the time. Uh, so blue circles are the south and north flows, red circles are north and south flows. The gray line is the um, difference in lake elevations, so south arm minus the north arm elevations. And, and, and that uh, the gray line correlates to the axis on the right side of the plot, elevation difference in feet. Um, you know, the big, the big picture takeaway is in 2016, um, they opened up the new to finish construction. We had a huge flow of, of water from the south arm moving into the north arm, and we had no flows uh, north of going from north to south. Uh, things evolved out there, there were seasonal patterns to the discharge value, but what's most relevant to the group today is the most recent data, basically from July 2022 uh, to the roughly current period, and you just note that the blue circles and the red circles all kind of just when we eyeball it, they look lower than what we've seen uh, historically, uh, for the most part, that's due to the new burn, right? They raised that burn four feet. So that, that burn was on the north side of the bridge. They raised four feet, that burn was raised to slow down any movement north and south because that's much saltier water. Trying to keep the salinity of the south arm in a range uh, that's reasonable. So <clears throat> just big picture takeaway, it, it definitely reduced flow of actually both directions, at least when we make these monthly districts. And when we zoom in on the more recent data from here is November 24, 2021, up to the most recent maintenance back in uh, late November, um, you can kind of see what, exactly what I, what I just said. The blue circles died off, the red circles uh, actually died off a bit as well. I just want to draw your attention uh, to the, the oval and the, the red circle that's above the blue circle. So most of the time, uh, when we're making these discharge measurements, they're under uh, quote calm conditions. So we capture average conditions out of there. Most of the time, south and north discharges are higher than north and south. But we chased an event where we have a strong wind event blowing water from the north to the south. When we made this visit, we made the discharge measurement, we measured uh, 350 PSS roughly moving north and south. Nothing moving. South and north. So, this is a unidirectional flow event. Uh, so, moving salt from the north arm to the south arm. So, the wind events are still moving salt when they're right north to south. Um, um, we have an uplifter velocity meter at this site, uh, collecting uh, velocity data throughout the water column. So, I have velocity in feet per second. The same meter is not showing seven different steps where velocities are measured here. Negative velocities are uh, north to south. So, and uh, positive losses are south and north. The new burn was completed about July 27th, so about where you see these large negative velocity values can suddenly pop up to near zero. Um, the south velocity values uh, that goes back down uh, and, and are, that was reduced after the new burn, believe it not, right here. Uh, but the dominating, uh, here's a zero line, by the way. So after this, Burn was constructed. These uh, velocities uh, that are north and south, even deeper uh, in the channel at this site, these all converge around zero. So the burn was doing its job. But as we, the time has evolved out here, as we log data uh, up to the current period, we see these strong negative velocities, these moving uh, <coughs> moving uh, water from the north to the south. And 
I have an event on the uh, September 22nd. This is the 360 CSS event we just got on the, on the, a couple of slides ago. I'm not going to go into detail on this uh, slide other than to remark that we have wind data at this location, the so wind speed, wind direction. Uh, we have the velocity data from the instrument. Um, we have this big north northwest wind event, uh, wind speed, which is red dash lines. Uh, increased peak at, uh, here about 16 miles per hour sustained. Uh, the wind direction shifted from south to uh, north. Here's the scale of the wind direction and wind speed. Um, so the solid line with all the velocity, uh, uh, maybe with the velocity vectors. These all go down to negative values, meaning north to south flow. We made the discharge measurements annually with the, uh, the, uh, the field instrument. Uh, during this period and during this period, our uploader will switch to measure data every one minute as opposed to every 15 minutes out here. Uh, so we made our discharge, and unfortunately, by the way, you know, there's a gap in the weather data, and that was a result of kind of adjusting the data water to handle the one minute data. But uh, rest assured, the wind event um, sustained north northwest through this period of the discharge rate that was actually made. Um, so we're just, we have events. The, that are happening in the moving water from the north to the south. Uh, this velocity data helps us understand essentially what the duration of these events are. And with Spong at Agarla and Utah State University, uh, their modeling effort, the, the objective here is to, to get us, you know, um, hourly discharge items from the model as opposed to having a one field measurement uh, made in the middle and our report the made during the event. Um, can get an idea of the time duration shown here. This is um, September 22nd, just after midnight, right here. And this is September 22nd, just 1800 hours over here. So we have very detailed data uh, to help us uh, understand the globe at this really critical uh, location on the globe. And here's a video of this event. So the technician who was out there um, grabbed as all of nature, but the video was just uh, before or after making the discharge measurements. And um, we're looking north here. This, this is going up in the peak is north. Uh, the red water, this is north on water. The berm that was raised is about right here. And this is a short video that you can see water moving from the south, or excuse me, from the north to the south. Um, and then the beautiful Langmire lines, um, uh, this, this kind of classic, uh, strong. Uh,
on microbialized or bioherms, whichever you prefer. Don't get me started. <laughs> but uh, I prefer the bioherm. It'd be interesting to see how uh, those velocities change at depth that might impact how, uh, especially during those wind events, how that might impact uh, brine flies being able to attach to microbialize. However, probably not at this um, because you're in the the under the bridge that probably concentrates uh, the changes, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, the good news is we actually purchased two of these guys, two of the gaming guys, and uh, for future research efforts, uh, on whatever, um, we'll have a second one that we can play in other locations on the way. If, if this particular location is too far away to evaluate, um, Jim has had like a lot of really cool observations about wind event well not wind events per se, but wind and microbialites and you know looking at the map being scraped off the map, you know, off the microbialites. But now we're dealing with high salinity, so they're vulnerable because the maps are not reproducing and microbes aren't reproducing. So they're they're vulnerable. Um, they're probably not as nicely attached with their extra polymeric substance. Um, and you've got lower lake level and you've got heavier water. And I can just imagine, I appreciate you bringing that up because I can imagine that being like not a great scenario for the microbes. So would this need to be anchored? I, how, uh, and how would uh, you Suppose that be done like in a microbial light field or something. Yeah, so they need to be anchored. Um, in the past, we, we put velocity meters in locations in the south of our port and we, we, we build um, concrete acres. Uh, we put uh, lead there, say, lead shock, <laughs> in and mix it in with the cement to get us enough dead mass and density in order to, to hold these. Uh, but yeah, they do get mounted with 200, 300 pounds of big, 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 uh, concrete anchors that we we uh, make ourselves. Um, so yeah, we, we could place one in, in a microbial field. Um, they have a blanking distance, right? So the, the instrument itself it has a height, and then these white dots are at the top. These are where all the acoustics are happening, uh, energy being sent out, receiving energy coming back. Uh, so obviously they're not going to be able to measure below the top of those sensors and you have the thickness of the anchor, uh, there is a length of distance that has to be factored into any monitoring that we do. And I think yeah. the thing that we probably, I mean, at least what I'm thinking of uh, as far as understanding what the, during those wind events, what uh, velocities at what depth uh, it, it, are they able to probably possibly knock off these uh, uh, brine fly larvae, uh, which I think probably stresses them enough to where they're not uh, able to survive winter mm -hmm. and things like that, which then reduces, I guess it effectively reduces the amount of microbial-like habitat, not just the exposed microbialites, but to a certain depth, uh, it effectively renders them uh, where they're not productive for brine fly larvae mm -hmm. at some point. And I Carly, did you see anything last week that was when you were out fly hunting? Um, she went, Jim, she went west of where we were the other day. Yeah, like last week in Hakimara. Did you see any places? I mean, mostly you're seeing exposed microbialites, but um, where you saw like larva, do you want to say something about digging into them like you were talking about before? Oh, yeah. The, I mean, the water is really low, and there's these pools, not pools, there's like most of the larva is like floating in these pools. But um, we would like take crumbs off the side of microbialites, and the larva were living in that, which 
Mm -hmm. The water must have just been there because the water should be underwater. But they were on the in like on the right side of the So yeah, in my case So I really know what that means, but that's why, yeah. They were underneath the shit of the But in the dry part. Yeah, like it's you know that's still more. Yeah, so we were still more. Yeah, so I mean but it was like if this was a water level, it probably would be they were like kind of up here. So it was quite a big difference. So we're doing we, intertidal ecology now. Yeah, we are. <laughs> 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 like tidal <laughs> for sure. <laughs> has a question. Does the USGS do the same mean help us observe when such events? Do we know how high the water piles up at the uh, UT causeway? So I haven't looked at the saline. So such uh, events do show up in the saline uh, gauge data. Uh, but there's even, in terms of understanding what's happening in the railroad causeway, we have a gauge on the north and south side of the railroad causeway near the new breach. These are new gauges. And so, you know, right now the salt air gauge, right, is high and dry. And we're getting salt water data from one of these new gauges I'm talking about, station 100, 124. Well, on the north side of the topway, there's a there's a new gauge. Um, I forget the station number. Do you remember? I don't even say that. I forget the station number. In this map, or to your friends, so if you have not used you as shit in this map, or we just zoom in on great quality and you can see all of our active monitors, right? You'll find that page. Um, so we have information <laughs> for sessions, et cetera, happening right at the railroad causeway. And um, I think that's going to be very helpful. Uh, I've seen they mentioned pressure heads, things like that um, at the causeway. And then you start thinking about the permeability of the causeway material and how. Water is not just moving through this debris, it's water it's moving through the causal material itself. Understanding these elevation differences at, at the causal are really important. So we've got a couple of gauges in the room. That's it. Cool, Jeff, I see. Yeah. We all think Jeff, sir. I mean, we all know really helping drive a lot of the very public work and keep it on task. I need to marry that data to the bathymetry data to see. The shoreline movements, uh, if you're measuring, see how the, that changes. Oh, like the sun moving around? Well, just the exposure and stuff. Oh, right. yeah. um, based on a wind. For sure. Yeah. 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 No, we do engage the a lot of causeways. We're going to try to keep building on for a while. Yeah, I'm taking up all the time. I'm sorry. I see a little bit of water. No, my right. last minute is stand. Oh, you watch is nagging you. You get a bossy one. Okay, so I'll turn over to Steve and then Okay. Um, yeah, so I think I'll be presenting nutrient data, salinity data, and then I'll go into updating nutrient support. So speaking at the nutrients, so just a second, um, right up here, discharges and so just to add on to what Ryan is saying, we also have flood water quality profiles and water quality sensitivity. So it's just you view essentially what we're seeing out there in terms of the kind of parcels of south arm and north arm water. This is kind of a graphic of, of the bridge, and when we go out there, we work off the bridge, we lower our sun, and Collect the vertical profile of the water quality going through the north, uh, so the south arm water to make you warm, and then the north. Mm -hmm. And so here's a plot of the elevation um, to the surface of the water in green, and then the depth kind of to that mixing zone, and then there's the north arm water, and then the lake bottom of that. Side. And I go back to the 
over here and kill the front of the grid, and then the last thing over here. And you can see he has a um, consistent uh, depth to his thinking zone, about five feet below the water surface. And then when the burn was raised to the ground, which is four feet, we saw a, a pretty rapid drop in where that north arm water was. So it was about three feet lower than it had been before, about eight feet below the surface. Um, and I think many of our teams, we began to use more high frequency sampling here. We thought it would kind of watch the north arm water temperature there. And that's not what we observed. What we observed is um, maybe a, a kind of step lowering of that, where that north arm water is, um, but also susceptible to variability in, in wind direction. And Brian pointed out that a lot of data. In this sampling, we did not constrain it to sampling under calm conditions. We just went out whenever, um, whenever you know, we were at kind of like a two week time step. And so we did see what happened with that flow of north arm water in the surface under events like that flow reversal on September 22nd that Ryan was mentioning. So just to let you know that north arm water is still there. Um, it's still at the reach, but as Ryan kind of pointed out, it's not really moving. Um, but it, you know, the fact that it has persisted, we think that there is enough of these north to south wind events, enough water being transferred from the north that this uh, north arm flow is. Can I just clarify a little bit? I mm -hmm. know when Christine said that the so north arm water is not, not really moving. There, uh, there, so, you know, the red circles on, and I have the blue, red, and blue circles, red is warm south discharge. So, after the berm was raised, uh, the first few visits, uh, we had very uh, small discharge values for north to south, 10 CFS, noisy data, very slow velocity. Uh, but um, the, then the, the berm was raised, and you know, well, um, the berm was raised and time passed, and the elevation difference between the north and the south arms shrunk. Usually it's around a half a foot. It's down to almost basically nothing right now. They're almost at the same elevation. Um, and there's even times when the north arm is higher than the south arm during certain events. So we've observed discharge values for this north arm water that are about 50 CFS since the berm was raised and the, and the elevation is coming to more equilibrium. So there is some north arm water moving, um, not as much as historically out to 2016. Um, yeah, during this period, kind of right up to the berm, I think we used it in the zero. Oh, very low. Yeah. We still saw that north arm, but what is it now? Okay, so now I'll just jump into our water quality monitoring program. So um, here on this map, we're showing um, a lot of, for all of the nutrient monitoring, I know that's happening on right now. So that includes the flood agency program, these four sites shown in the yellow diamond. Uh, the intro site is kind of in between these crop symbols. And then I also, we also added on um, the biannual sampling site. This is done in cooperation with the Division of Water Quality, where we sample, um, I think it's like nine sites. Yeah. 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, 11, 9, Thank you. 
And then I just wanted to show uh, our data record of nutrients, uh, showing total cell phosphorus on the on the top, going like back to 2010. Um, you can just see these kind of shaded areas indicate where the deep brown layer has been present through time um, and where it hasn't been. And where we have observed the deep brown layer, you can see a, a really clear stratification of nutrients throughout the water column where shallow nutrients are much more diluted than um, nutrients at depth, especially for phosphorus, and also for the solar salt nitrogen. So this, these are data from 3510 from the survey. And digging into the solar salt nitrogen values a little bit more to that relevant to Gary and the, the models, um, I just, just to give folks a sense of how kind of nitrogen has shifted through time in response to different lake conditions. So prior to 2014, this is about the time when uh, the forwards began to be closed. Uh, well, there was connectivity kind of here. There was connectivity kind of between the north and the south. We saw the deep brown layer present and shallow uh, shallow low methane concentrations around the over 3.8 milligrams per meter um, higher. And then when connectivity kind of between the north and south was shut off, it was largely restricted um, during the period of uh, kind of cosmic closure. You know, only the lake side breach was active, was open at this point, but there's not really an exchange of north and south happening here. So it was still some question mark. So the deep brown layer disappeared during this time. We saw an increase of uh, total cell nitrogen in throughout the water column um, at the both shallow and deep samples of about 4.8. Then when we opened the breach again, we saw sequestration of total cell nitrogen in the deep brown layer as that was established. Um, the surface nitrogen went down to 4.2 milligrams per liter. And then at this site, last fall, we began to see the deep brown layer eroding away at, at 3510. Um, and with that, we see the shallow and deep total cell nitrogen concentration converging once again. So um, no longer uh, nutrients being sequestered at depth here. And we see the concentrations go up. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Um, when does the breach get opened on the graph? On the graph this here? one would be right about here. Oh, okay, because I, the way you were saying it, it was like where the gray line yeah. started there. Yeah. And I'm going, but it was rising before. <laughs> yeah, there's one of the breaches open. It was about a month, probably this side of the line, maybe eight months before we started establishing the deep run there. And, um, Christine, I wonder if there might be also an effect of concentrating with the salt and nitrogen. Would it be interesting to take a look at the nitrogen pool total mass? Yes, of the salt? so that's what we're looking at with Hannah. Yes, no, you're right. It does look like it's been pretty constant over time, that total nitrogen mass pool. So I think this would be about the concentration of the shifting rate. Let's let the water yeah. And then just uh, trying to have a longing here to see some stuff that's more bioavailable. Um, we tend to see ammonia in the surface samples would be really near our detection limit, um, 0.25. So they're near nitrogen. Um, again, when we see the deep brown air present, much higher concentrations uh, at depth, a lot longer, four to six milligrams of concentration. So, um, again, that's kind of gone away with the shallow Okay, so we can talk about the data today, but here is an update on our salinity. Um, I'm just trying to see if one of these on the last six and a half years back to 2010 on my record began to be present. Um, and I, because I, I think many of you have heard our great source equation of state has been extended to higher salinities. Previously, we could only go up to a density of 1.145 or 60 centimeter, but we've extended that up into um, basically more on water. We're confident in the equation's ability to compute density. Or compute one of these from higher than sea water. So um, I'm showing you site data from 2565, that's our site in Karen Bay, and 3510, and our site in Silver Bay. Um, and shallow, shallow salinity, so these different colored sites are so Karen Bay in orange and Silver Bay is purple. Um, shallow salinity is going to be triangle. And the shallow salinity that each of these sites tend to be um, quite close together. There is some seasonal. Uh, Variability there, there might be, um, you know, freshening at in Harrington Bay when there isn't any over there, by the versa, there might be higher salinities in um, Harrington. But generally, they tend to be very similar, and the salt uh, appears to be quite homogenous 
At that, though, in the prime there, there is quite a difference. So, in fact, you may be consistent with the higher form of the prime over bay. Um, and as you can imagine, the more firm water is plunging into the breach and traveling and making its way south, it's actually a very consistent with the um, The most recent salinities are about 185, 186 grams per liter. Uh, compared to October samples, they're about 183 grams per liter. So we did a lot, but not quite, we're not starting to go down yet. And we've actually increased by a few grams per liter, and maybe that's due to mixing out the deep ground there. So um, we also have measurements from the end of October at our new breach site that was 187 grams per liter for shallow, 256 grams per liter for the next to south water. And then UGS also collected a salinity sample um, near Seltzer Reef, Reef at the end of October, and that was um, 181 grams per liter. So it's constant. And then I just zoomed into the last year of salinity data just so we can kind of get a sense of how much variability is given your specific kinds of salinity concentration. So um, if you look at data um, that here I believe this was um, in October, November of 2021. Salinities were about 163, 168 grams per liter. And if we compare that to the high salinities we're seeing now, it's attaining about 17 and 23 grams per liter. So that's how much we've come up in about a water year time frame. Um, in the spring, when we saw the, the spring runoff, we just observed the region of the solar salinity um, April. That's on the slope 168. If we compare that to our high of spring now, that's attaining about 27, 28 grams. So just to give you a sense of how much fluctuation in salinity we observed, uh, we observed last year um, in response to the level change. And I think that's it. So uh, I'll turn over to Anna and give you an update on the nutrient mass balance work. Um, and I guess while I'm here, the saline line is saying where it starts to stand now with the planning um, is that we have many of the people you saw on the saline line call that mm -hmm. formation uh, group. We're basically writing a science plan. We're integrating all the feedback we received from um, the folks who are in, who are in attendance to those, um, those meetings. We distilled it down to kind of these priority research questions from there. The other part of that is we're doing a, a comprehensive literature review, trying to figure out what science gaps there are. All of that's going to be pulled together and they're writing a science plan for how they will execute um, basically the research over the next five years. And so their goal is to have a draft by draft zero, draft draft, uh, by the end of, I think, January, and then hoping to have a more final draft by March. So I have a kind of a time frame. I it's really just developing this um, science plan. Cool. Uh, so I think I'm going to go for a quick uh, update. We covered this back in August. Um, but we are looking at nutrient pools in inputs and exports from groups to and from Great Salt Lake. Um, we have some nitrogen listed here, but we are working on phosphorus as well as the included in the location. Um, as an overview of what data we're using, um, she's left our four sites that are monthly, uh, and in monthly, you can get plenty of information from there. Um, the National Atmosphere Definition Network, they just published their 2021 data. Um, it's not included in the plot that I'll show you, but it will be included in the publication. Uh, so, since just the last time, we have um, a completed that uh, great little like volume data set that, that I talked about last time. And what it, um, what it did in terms of our nutrient pool, it gave us a uh, a final resolution of what the volume in the deep brine layer is compared to the data set that uh, Matt used in his, his previous publication. But you can see that you know, there's not a huge change in overall total level of nitrogen in Great Salt Lake through, throughout our study period, um, even when we have the opening and closing of, of freeze in the hallway. Um, based on this, this new data set, our um, annual constant or annual mass is uh, really comparable to what they uh, um, estimates were in 
original publication, we have a relative difference of less than six percent for, for all of for the years that come by. So basically, you you, you um, kind of revise the symmetry uh, and uh, improve the symmetry mm -hmm. and, and recompute uh, and compare it to maps Correct. For, for the 2010 2014 period. Yes. And we think it's a lot of work going through profiles and really like identifying where that deep black layer starts. Um, whereas it did not, he had a, a very rough method. And maybe overestimated or underestimated at some point. So more refining the elevate or the, the elevation of the deep riser in the water hall. Yeah. And then reading the QG maps and comparing mm -hmm. what they would have done. So so really, really pretty good um, as far as uh, a comparison goes. Can I have that? Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. Um so the inflows have been modeled, and again, um, we were looking to get with what they did. There are a couple of years where um, there's about 18 to 20 cents, so it's a different. And sometimes uh, we are estimating more, sometimes it's less than what they did. We'll um, go into that a little bit more when it's in the publication, so we can kind of identify the different ways that we use. Discharge at Bear River Bay. He created a, a regression. I've used um, discharge at Corinne, but where that is under 300 PFS, I estimated that it's zero to zero. Bear River Mountain Flow. Um, this data does include um, flows from the north arm here in this purple, um, the purple. It accounts for a large portion of what we calculate as input for each year of the accurate because What we don't have is that information prior to the opening of the new breach. There's a little bit of information about flow through culvert, but not, not really good data so that we can get an estimate of what's coming from there prior to 2017. The discharge at the breach was estimated by uh, Christina. She did a linear, linear interpolation. Um, like Brian was talking about, the new data sets of flow at the breach. If we, if it becomes available prior to this being published, we'll include that. So it might be a little bit different of an estimate from what we get. But just to clarify there, I think you're talking about the model and what Song is doing. Song may help us, we, we might be able to produce a continuous record or near continuous record of discharge rather than just one of those um, discrete roughly monthly measurements. Uh, so, like I said before, the um, atmospheric definition program they just included, they just published their 2021 data. When when we go to do the publication, this will be updated as well. Um, uh, what I do have this time is done uh, estimates for bank work. Uh, this doesn't account for uh, negative discharge at lake side. Um, I did keep days with zero flow and the calibration estimation. Um, that is for 40 flows. And then again, when you breach an estimate of uh, from the discrete measurement. But we can see a huge export from, um, for the South and North flow starting in 2017 compared to just like time. Apart from 2014, our relatives present different with getting out to less than 4%. Something in 2014. Not looking really good, so this will need some refinement before we go into the competition. Um, but overall, um, the model for water runs with fresh water is pretty much done. Uh, we do see that 5 to 18 percent um, of the total salt nitrogen in Great Salt Lake comes from these things that atmospheric and, and 
Um, and then we do have a, a rough percentage for that uh, total dissolved nitrogen that's exported from Great Salt Lake. Um, less than one to less than twenty six percent is exported through the causeway. Just going further again, the new breach data can be updated with um, new flow estimates. And then we'll um, have a rough draft of this publication hopefully in February. Um, and then the, the data will either be published um, as supplemental information for the publication or as a data release for science and science, right? Um, and that's about all that's, that's it for the nutrient update part. Um, the equation of state, we have um, we confirmed that there's a really good relationship between these higher densities and our current equation of state. Um, the data for this and it's going to be published in a data release on science base, and then the analysis will be included in the fall study that Dr. Christine is working on. Sorry, we went long. Questions? All right, we'll shift over to uh, Gary in our last. Uh, Okay, let's switch over and talk some biology now. Um, first of all, it's not working. Hold on, hold on. I'm trying to get it set up on Zoom too. First of all, is it working? Yes. First of all, we're going to talk about some in terms of the shrimp and the torque of the phytoplankton. It's going to be different than what Kyle presented because the data I am presenting here includes data for the months that they couldn't sample that were provided thanks from the Brian Trim Cooperative um, because they were able to get out. And so if we look at phytoplankton um, in terms of chlorophyll concentration, red is the average of the last five years and blue is this past year. And what you can see, as Kyle said, started very low this year, eventually peaked, came down a bit, but over most of the summer, it was much higher than it is on the five-year average. And the reason for that is because run trip numbers went way down. Yeah. So it's less crazy. It bottoms out here in August and September, and that's not so much from grazing by the run trip, I think, as much as it is from the higher salinity and higher temperatures. So the phytoplankton is responding to the abiotic environment not being raised down. Then the reason for that, what you can see here, is that in the fall it's increasing faster than on average, and that's because it's not being held down by grazing again. As it gets cooler, and especially temperature as it gets cooler, it's growing much faster. So we get into the differences this year in terms of the phytoplankton dynamic when we include the data for those two months that uh, G plus doesn't have. Overall, the composition of the phytoplankton is very similar to what it is in most years in terms of the percentages of uh, chlorophyte, uh, green algae, the filariophytes, the diatoms, and the cyanophytes, the blue greens. However, what I want to point out here is here's the diatoms. They're much higher on average as a percentage in the summer months. And since we depend on the G plus sampling, we don't have two months of the phytoplankton numbers that we could do the analysis on composition. But the diatoms were much higher in the summer than over the five year average. And the cyanophytes were also, the blue greens were also tending to be higher. I'm interpreting this to the die off of microbial life. 
and being washed off into the lake. Yeah. And this actually fits with what we've seen in past years when they're put under stress, that's when we're seeing that their numbers in the water column itself goes up. So we're seeing some differences this year from what we've seen in the average over the last five years in terms of viral content. Okay, we've completed the survivorship, transitioning, and reproduction of shrimp at higher salinities in the laboratory studies where we put known numbers of shrimp in with different amounts of food and measure their survival, transition, and reproductive ability. First of all, in terms of survivorship, nuclei are predicted. The dotted line is what we predict from our mathematical model that I've been building for the lake of what they're going to do in terms of survivorship. And the three bars here are what we get at 150 and 180 ppc. And it falls pretty much right along the line. So as the salinity goes up, the nuclei don't survive it. For the juveniles, the dotted line here is what is predicted was the built into the model. And what our new experimental results tell us is that it actually is flattening out for survival of the juveniles. So there has there is a lower survival of juveniles at, at high salinity but it seems to plateau. And we see the same thing pretty much for adult survivorship. It's coming down, but it's plateauing. So the high salinity is really nasty for the nuclei, but not as bad for the juveniles and adults. For transitioning to the next life stage, nuclei to adults, Again, the nuclei pretty much fall along what the mathematical model, what we built into the mathematical model originally predicted compared to the bars here. And juvenile the transition tends to flatten out as well. What's disturbing right here is the adult reproduction. Virtually nothing has these higher salinity. Okay. They're reproducing. I don't want to say they're not reproducing, but the level of reproduction is much lower than here at 120. Way down. And as a cautionary thing from what we've talked about already this morning, why did we get so much reproduction this year? You had the 150. What is this? 150 to 160 ppc in the spring in the lake. That's what allows the shrimp to reproduce a lot. Also, you had all of this food here and very few females, so the females are getting high nutrition. So even though the salinity isn't good for reproduction, the female's nutritional state is high. And in the spring this year, the salinity wasn't that bad at 150 to 160 ppc. Okay. So, cross your fingers that in this coming spring, we get that drop in salinity, at least for some brief period of time, in the spring, early summer, that's going to stimulate reproduction in the female. I mean, we are dealing here with a very different world than what we've been looking at over the past. Is that reaction of lower first person male in high school is, is that with the same amount of food? Is that the other experiment that we did? Yes. So but if you high? look at it this year, that food availability is higher than the highest level we previously used in our experiment. Okay, hmm. let's talk about the model that we've been building to look at the ecosystem in the Great Salt Lake. That model includes abiotics, the physical conditions of the lake, phytoplankton dynamics, 
leading into the trim dynamic, and then feeding it to birds, and then we get some output. Let's look at what the lake looks like this year. The top set of cars are a bunch of gas on this in the lake, nauplia in the lake, juveniles in the lake, and adults in the lake. First of all, as Kyle pointed out, everything took place later this year than on average over the last five years. So this is the average for the last five years. Second thing is the high salinity essentially wipes out nuclei in the lake. This is had go through multiple generations and a high nuclei level over time in the summertime went up, boom, it crashed, and there may be this small peak as or small peak as Kyle brought up. <clears throat> See the same thing with juveniles. They went up, come way down, and that's what generally happens in the lake. That was not novel. But adults, boom, skyrocketed, crashed down, and probably were at much lower levels than on average in the lake later in the summer. We look at this. This production occurred much earlier. And was much higher than what we've seen in the last five years. So the dynamics of the shrimp population was very different than in the past. Would you think that that suggests a not that had high survivorship though? No, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. No, the not that they didn't have high survivorship. I'm going to point out in a minute. There was no production of nuclei. Okay? Everything went into this production, not into live young production. So they survived in that lower salinity period. She was they didn't mentioned. survive well, but yeah. they die off or can transition into juveniles and adults, and they're not being replaced. Okay, here's the model prediction from the model that I presented in August to the group. The blue line here is the observed in the lake. The red line is the model product, uh, prediction for the lake. And we've got the fit of prediction and observed value uh, presented here. Pretty good fit, not too bad. But one of the things that you see here is that the, if we look at predicted and observed, is one is only 52%, 0.62 of the predicted has to be as much lower than what was observed on average. And also, the intercept here of 8.28 is greater than zero. We want that to be not different than zero, and we want that slope to be one. That tells us we have a good fit. Something strange is going on here. We're doing pretty well with juveniles, pretty well with adults, but we're not doing well with mostly a high or with this production being predicted in the model. Well, we don't have this experimental data from our lab experiments. What we would need to look at is take females, raise them at different salinities, and while they're alive in the jar, in the laboratory, raise the salinity. We, all of our experiments are in a constant salinity. If you look at the G-SLEP long-term data that I've been putting together for the project, what we see is not only does this production go up with the salinity of the lake, but it also goes up with the change in salinity over the lifetime of the female. This year, the salinity when females were out there reproducing went up on average 0.71 percent. That's 71 units out of the PPD. Put that into this relationship and it says that this production should have been greater.
greater by 44% than what you predict just based on salinity. So that's not built into the model. However, I can take the model prediction and do some back of the envelope calculations. Increase this production by 44%. And when you increase this production by 44%, what do you have to do to nuclei production? It has to go down by 44% to produce this instead of nuclei. This is a rough calculation back of the envelope. This is now what you get. Much better fit. Nearly one here, only 0.99 here, very close to zero. Much higher here, we're at 0.78. Much closer to zero at point six three. The fit increases because of taking into account this effect of increasing salinity during the lifetime of the female rather than holding it constant. If salinity were decreasing over the lifetime of the female, you'd get just the opposite result. So there's some more detailed biology here, and Thomas, don't ask me to do the experiment of burying the salinity of burying the salinity in the lifetime of a female. We were talking about that and how you would have to do it by every two days, increasing it a little bit at a time because you jumped it all a big amount. Shop. Yeah, you you shot them and they die. Right. It can be done, but. All you got to do is leave the top off and the daily evaporation. I do that in my lab all the time. The opposite of what that does is it changes the volume for the food availability. Oh, that's true. We're holding the food availability constant. Yeah. So every two days, we're changing, uh, cleaning the, the jar mm -hmm. and also um, replacing evaporation. So you could do it by changing the salinity of the water you're adding back in. Sure. Sure. Can't be done. Okay, now I want to talk about <clears throat> where we, our big focus is right now, which is on nitrogen availability, decomposition, and cycling within the lake of the nitrogen. And this I find very exciting right now because I think we have identified the culprit in terms of tying up nitrogen availability in the lake. So first of all, we completed Phytoplankton, dead phytoplankton, decomposition, different temperatures, different salinity. As you can see, as temperature goes up, there's a, a temperature effect on decomposition. Uh, the higher the temperature, the greater the decomposition. Um, the higher the salinity, the lower the decomposition. But look, forget that variability, and what this tells us is 90% of dead phytoplankton are decomposed within 14 days of dying. Fast. <clears throat> the average nitrogen concentration per milligram of dead phytoplankton is 0.25%. That means there's 0.00065 milligrams of nitrogen per microgram of chlorophyll A per liter in the lake. We have to have all these things to eventually build this into the ecosystem model that we're creating, all these conversion factors. Ah, thinking rate. 0 0.12, 0 0.012 meters per day. I don't think. That is good. That means you're in the water column decomposing and that nitrogen is right out there in the water column for the phytoplankton to re pick up and grow with. Next thing, dead brine shrimp. We finished this experiment just a week or so ago. We have the same sort of effect of decomposition with temperature and salinity. Higher decomposition tends to be at higher temperatures, lower decomposition at um, high temperature, um, 
lower decomposition and higher solidity. Okay, 90% of are broken up within 23 days for a dead line trip. That's pretty fast, too. A dead line trip, 6.97% nitrogen per milligram, 0.031 milligram of nitrogen per individual, sinking rate, 0.25 meters per day. They're staying in the water top. And basically decomposing in the water top. The phytoplankton can pick that nitrogen up. Okay, this is the experiment that's the hardest that we're doing right now, difficult to measure, and uh, we just have one temperature and one salinity, uh, 120 ppc at 20 degrees centigrade. And 90% is decomposed in 120 days. The brine shrimp fecal pellets don't decompose. And the average pellet is 2.7% nitrogen per milligram, which is 0 0.00003 milligrams of nitrogen per pellet. Thinking rate of pellets. 89 meters per day. They're little rocks. They go into the water column and they fall. You got it. And they make a little bit of sand. Let's look at some benchmarks. You mean two of the Let's look at some benchmarks here. And these are just, I just pick as benchmark to show what's going on here to give you an idea. Microbial like that, let's say it's approximately one meter. Average length depth is four meters. Maximum length depth is approximately 10 meters. Here's the fall rate. Dead phytoplankton, 0.012 meters per day. Shrimp body, 0.24 meters per day. Shrimp poop, 89 meters per day. The phytoplankton takes 83 days to hit a microbialite. It's gone, it's evaporated, it's all decomposed by then. Lake bottom, 333 days to get to the average lake bottom, it's decomposed. Maximum lake bottom, 833 days to get there. It's gone. Phytoplankton, dead phytoplankton, is critical for the nitrogen because it's cycling so fast in the lake, but it's not being lost. Shrimp body is falling at 0.24 meters per day. It takes four days to hit the microbial life, 15% is gone. 17 days to get to the average life death. 70% is gone. 42 days to get to the maximum life death. 100% is gone. So shrimp bodies, to a great extent, are going to recycle within the water column before they hit the bottom. There's going to be some accumulation of nitrogen from shrimp bodies, but not much. Shrimp pellets, 89 meters per day, straight down. Less than a day is the microbialite, and nothing's been released yet from them. Less than one day to get to the decomp uh, to the average life death. Nothing released. Less than one day to get the maximum life death. Nothing released. Christine, this is what's filling your traps up. Yes. In, in the lake is shrimp poop. <laughs> this is where it's possible that nitrogen can be tied up in the lake and not recycled and is critical to understanding the whole dynamics of nitrogen in the lake. Especially with a deep brown layer. Because once it's down in that deep brine layer, it's going to sit there for a while.
No, this is Tim Salt Bottom. I belong to a group that we give out t-shirts to people as they age. So when you turn 50, you get a dinosaur t-shirt. When you turn 60, you get a cryobite t-shirt. And when you turn 70, you get a stromatolite t-shirt. And when you turn 80, you get dirt. Okay? Well, I got someone a stromatolite t-shirt at 70, and the t-shirt says, stromatolites are nothing but layers of hardened algae, sweat, and food. And that's what this is telling us. Bird to 
see how fast the bird feathers decompose. Carrie, it would be interesting uh, to study once the deep brine layer disappears and you have this whole sort of sandy benthic bottom to see how the microbes actually decompose the brine shrimp pellets and at what rate. That's the, what the microbial um, activity that decompose. Well, that's what we're doing in the decomposition study. That's the microbes in the water that are decomposing things. But the microbes in the benthos can be different from the ones in the water. Yeah. And as the deep brine layer disappears, you get all of this benthos that gets exposed. That could also be an important source of ultimately nitrogen cycling. Yeah. We can do that by collecting microbial inputs for the experiment from deeper down near the uh, bent to the bottom of the lake versus in the water column itself. What we're dealing with right now is water column. Yeah. So we're putting emphasis on the shrimp fecal pellets right now as being the key to understanding the nitrogen specimens within the lake. The other thing we have to determine is we know that the shrimp themselves will filter out their own pellets and consume them. So we're working on a way of measuring that. And that's become difficult or complicated because you're putting a number of shrimp pellets and they're producing pellets as well. And so how do you separate between the two? And also your sedimentation rates could be very different in the lake with wind and wave action and currents. And exactly, exactly. This is a cylinder and measuring the yeah. falling down of the cylinder. But we need to first approximations of what these values are. Yeah. And it's absolutely true that turbulence in the lake is going to tend to keep these things in the water column and reduce the flow rate. But 87 meters per Day, that's a pretty high uh, yeah, thinking rate. Right yeah. Less than yeah, a few hours of calm weather. And right, they're down on the bottom. Mike Conover, could you just get some extra ballerope to stand and make some yeah. more <laughs> yeah. We need more ballerope to keep everything up. <laughs> so, anyway, that's where we're at. Any other questions? So you look at how many people pellets are produced per sure per day? We're trying to get that right now. Okay, at different food levels yeah. and temperatures and salinity. We're trying to get that because that's the next thing we have to have to build in. Right now, the model does not include nitrogen cycling. It has a single value that goes in each year, as you know, and then do the dilution of the lake and then make phytoplankton point predictions on that. There is a model for nitrogen cycling that I built but we don't have the numbers to put into it, so there's no sense putting it into the model yet and trying to run it. That's what we're trying to do, is get some, at least some rough ideas of these equations, relationships, and constants that we can make these calculations on. That's where we're at. It kills me that you always anticipate the next thing and are already working on that experiment. <laughs> well, you see it with the results that you're getting, okay? So the, the fecal pellet stuff needs a lot of work yet. I've got an undergraduate doing a senior research project on that in the lab. And it, it, they're just a pain to work with. Um, just figuring out their decomposition rates was difficult. We tried mass, that didn't work. Uh, so we are using chlorophyll because they're eating chlorophyll and that's in the fecal pellet and we're looking at decomposition of the chlorophyll in the pellet as the marker to track through to get decomposition. Mm -hmm. But you get a lot more noise than you would. Yeah. Are you doing much of in the benthic area? Does the bacteria flush? We haven't, we, I know, we haven't done that yet. We're doing everything with water column at that. At this stage, because the water column is what most of the model is operating on, yeah. and so that's where we're at right now. Yeah. 
you know, it's, it's the same thing. As, I know Thomas wants me to do another experiment at 200 ppc on survival and, and reproduction. Um, we can only do so many of these experiments because they're very time consuming. Yeah. One comment on the turbulence then. The pellet decomposition is being done on a shaker table, very gently shaking things to get turbulence because without that turbulence, the pellets don't break down very fast at all. They're probably breaking down two to three times slower than what we're measuring with some very gentle shaking. Well, then with the short life cycle of the brine shim, and you know the variability within a year you can get you know sort of a lot of cycling that ha that's happening whereas when you look at at the you know total dissolved nitrogen and you get what about nine samplings a year you can get you know some of that some of those that variability that may be buffered um i mean we definitely saw that with ammonia did we still where we could see that relationship between the brine shrimp dying off and then followed by an ammonia peak. Yeah. Yeah, very short. Yeah, very short. But ammonia breaks down much quicker than yeah. 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 Anything else? I have an observation. I've been just reading a lot about um, what happens to Denaliella under salt stress? I've been reading these sort of genetics papers and trying to understand because um, a lot more genetics has been done on Denaliella than any of the other species. Um, and one of the papers that's really stuck with me is that as you increase salinity, um, and this is the same thing that happens to Haloarchaea, uh, the cells have to accumulate something inside to balance with the outside for osmoregulation. So if you increase salinity on the outside, the glycerol production goes up. And so they're not, it, it also cell division goes down. So, so they're not reproducing as much at higher salinity. They're making less cells. But it, I'm just in my head, I'm thinking, but is each cell more nutritious because it's higher in glycerol? So lower cell numbers, but higher caloric content is odd. You're dealing with a level of detail. That's what molecular people do. Well, we ecologists try to come up with a couple of general numbers for big picture. And most people would argue that I'm a reductionist in biology, okay, compared to. But that's energetic. You know, you still need the different components. Yeah. You, you know, to yeah. Yeah. Right. But it's good carbon storage. Yeah. Yeah. It's really. I mean, it's every glycerol is three carbons and three alcohols. So, yeah. I mean, it's good carbon storage. Yeah. Good eat. So we have. We have front front. Yeah. Three alcohol. It's a fat alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. I can't answer that. One thing we look for. One thing we look for. Yep. With the increased salinity, yeah. see if we're going to the Oh, yeah. 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 So, in speaking of speaking of carbon storage, I just had this really interesting conversation with an algae specialist um, who does some denaliella work about not just glycerol as carbon storage, but carotenoids as carbon storage. So, why is denaliella salina um, orange? Because um, right. I'm pretty sure vertus also have carotenoid um, pathways, but they're, they're not making them. Right. Um, but uh, if you want, carotenoids are like C60 and C30. They're like giant hydrocarbon chains. So talk about carbon storage. So the reason I think about it as oxidative stress, because you eat watermelon as an antioxidant, right? You eat your sweet potatoes as an antioxidant. But Actually, some people are thinking about carotenoids as carbon storage. And if you're in a stressed out environment, making high carbon molecules to store makes sense. So I think that we, we have seen some salina. Uh, some of the shrimpers brought me some samples last spring of salina they were seeing on the lake. Well, they saw orange stuff and they wanted to know what it was. But it, it was denial of salina. So we are seeing pockets of it, obviously, on the margins. 
But um, I, I just got to wonder if that shift, um, if we're really close to the Lions Optimum. Oh, I, I, that, that's yeah. why I, 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 I yeah. Andrea, you know, how many of the five of the Lions yeah, yeah. keep her eyes open for that? And she, that she isn't seeing it. So those but are the other things. So now it's hard to change. Yeah. Doesn't mean it's good food for the brown shrimp. No, no, no. The larger the carbon chain may be, it's harder to decompose. I think it's yes, and uh, it gets the nutrition from it. Right, right. You still have to break down those carbon chains. Right. Yes, yes. So for the non-biologists in the room, Denaliella veritas likes the south arm, and Denaliella spolina, the orange one, likes the north arm. So what Gary is saying is he's not seeing the line in the south arm. Yes, yes. And Volt never is never to see it. Yeah. 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 But, and Volt's never to see it in the South End. Oh, I hope not. This is getting more nutritious than uh, one. And everything we get is another new world. Everything we've done in the modeling that is based on where it is being the quarterback. There's also a new paper out by a group in Korea looking at um, genes that are transcribed in brine shrimp under salinity stress. And uh, there are certain genes that uh, get turned off at the higher you go in salt, um, and certain genes that get turned on. And the genes that get turned on in part are the carotenoids, synthetic pathways, but other things. So when you see those smaller, redder shrimp, and higher, stress. I mean, they just need the antioxidants because they're having oxidative yeah. damage because of stress. So I, I think that um, that article is kind of interesting to me as a geneticist thinking about like. You but know, you're asking for detail. I can't go into this. You can't put that in the model. Well, I can, but it would be. I'm just saying. Impossible. I'm just saying. I, mean, I think it's so cool. You're seeing, you know, what's happening. You guys too large level, but actually something is happening at the cellular level that's making that happen. And then we've got Ryan and Christine who are bringing in their turbulence and their recession. <laughs> and I think this is just the coolest thing. But the bonding, you know, when we see that the hilltop the survival and the um the developmental uh, going from stage to stage yeah. is changing. Yes. Yeah. That takes into those kind of things. It, does. it doesn't take the detail of it into account, but it takes it out, takes it in as sort of a black box where you're feeding this information in and says, oh, this is changing. Yeah. There, there's a, a group that's been doing work on the upregulating of genes um, that help with temperature resistance um, mm -hmm. using the Artemia franciscana in Vietnam. And what was interesting there is that the Artemia franciscana, it was thought that there was actually a genetic selection over the last 20, 25 years or so since they were introduced. You know, what that group has found is that it's actually epigenetic. Uh -huh. so the upregulation is epigenetic. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, that's what I said in my post oh, really? Again, that all can be built yeah. in as a black box in terms of any functions relating to limiting temperature to survival. Yeah. And uh, a transition between stages. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are long term effects. When I have shrimp in a tank, as soon as they die, they stay high in the water bottles. But then, as time goes on, um, a, lot, a lot of shrimp will maintain a salinity a little bit lighter, lower salinity in the water column. But after it's dead, its salinity then matches the water column that it's in, and so they start to sink. And so I would think, uh, in terms of what happens, you have to use brine shrimp of food that have been dead for different lengths of time to determine their sink weight, because I think it will vary based on uh, how long they've been dead. Well, that's essentially taken into account. Where's your body? Going at 0.25 meters per day, that was calculated over a number of days. So they're equilibrating in and then going down. Okay. So it's not instantaneous. Yeah. 
The pelvis are in instantaneous. You put them into a graduated cylinder and you just watch them and chill down. But you know, yeah. That's, it's, it's, they're being watched over a long enough period of time that that's probably the same thing. I don't think so. We're using like one liter cylinder, you know, about the AI. It's going to be changing, of course, with the salinity of the water. These calculations, like I said, these were pilot studies, all done at 120 BPC. Either way, it exceeds your 10 meter maximum with that. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. It's still going to fall at a very high rate, yeah. yeah. Because it is a bad damage. Carrie, one other question, please. Yeah. I would assume that brine shrimp bodies as well as shrimp, so uh, they can't see the deep water layer that hangs on the uh, interface of it. Does that happen to the pellet too? Are they, is there an entity such that they can take the temperature? I don't know. I don't know. But at 87 meters per uh, day, that's a pretty high density. Yeah, I would, I would guess they think that would be an interesting question if we get to that. Christine? So we did yeah. deploy them in your house. Did you find that? Stick a little We did deploy them in the house. We did deploy them in the house. We did deploy them in the in my cylinder tanks too with the brand layer. All the sediment gathered at the bottom. And they could, it was pretty thick, I like, um, Yeah. And they didn't swim in there, and they thought like, it was a sediment and a lot of work. Any other questions for here? Could you address how the floating concentration factors in the nutritional value of branch No, I have no information on that. Sorry for that. <laughs> um, what I can tell you is that the model right now is telling us is that the bird density on the green density on the lake should be the colony. These conditions have not been positive for the green density. So that's where we're at in terms of translating this over to the birds. So we'll that. Uh, Function under that one year lag. So we should see that decrease the depression in the numbers next year. Yeah. From the from this year. Yeah. Okay. There should be a lag on that. Yeah. But given the capital of the last five years, the prediction is that it's going back. Which is what you're saying. There's a lot of things I can't answer. We don't have the details. So. You got to start. <laughs> the other thing about the reading numbers is there's always a choice they have between Mono Lake and here. And so if Mono Lake is very bad and it's been very bad, then more of them will come to the Great Salt Lake. Right. It's, it may be bad, but it's the best of the options. Still better. All right, then. Well, thanks, Gary. Okay, well, so, I, and I was just going to mention there a couple things, unless anybody else has anything they want to discuss as far as the research goes. Um, and Mike, uh, we were able to get the uh, bioenergetics uh, proposal passed, and it is uh, approved and funded, and Lauren is going to be the PhD student who will be uh, taking that on. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so she was accepted uh, into the USU uh, PhD program, so we'll be uh, anxiously uh, awaiting her uh, hard work and de dedicated years over the next uh, few to get. Uh, that going. So, um, 
probably start uh, as soon as we get going on that. We might be leaning on some uh, input from everybody because that's probably going to require some adapt adaptive uh, studies because uh, that's such a big uh, undertaking. I'm not sure how we're going to get around that, and certainly I don't have the mental horsepower to figure that out right now. So. Uh, we may be asking for input from the, the tag as we move forward with that. Mike, did you want to say anything? As far as um, just two things. Um, there have been a lot of groups that have helped fund this bioenergetic model, and um, I greatly appreciate um, the support of so many different groups and agencies. And also, I want to point out that it's been a long and difficult process. It's gone on for a couple of years. And it has been successful because John Love um, has spent an inordinate amount of time in the last two years trying to get this thing to fruition. And I greatly appreciate that. Well, hopefully it's uh, worth it because uh, I believe in it. <laughs> hopefully it isn't just a, an exercise. But... And on another note, um, I heard yesterday that the graduate school has accepted um, Mark Bale's dissertation that is the final step. And so Mark is now officially Dr. Mark Bale. That's great. All right, anything else anybody has or wants to bring up uh, or before we conclude, and I forgot to mention in my email when uh, during the invite that we would be providing lunch, which is uh, awaiting everyone. So, uh, anything else? Okay, well, before we do conclude, let me uh, set some dates for the next couple of tag meetings. Uh, I think I had proposed March 1st. Is that right? I can't actually remember, but I think yeah. I had proposed March 1st last time. Is that still good with everyone? Yeah. That's Wednesday, I assume? Yes. Yeah. I just had a question on the USGS uh, nutrient cycling research, how that was progressing, and if we had any plans to continue that work. Yeah, so, and... Uh, Basically, we had uh, even upgraded our uh, funding and uh, to uh, continue the nutrient work. I don't know if you want to provide anything more than that, Ryan. Well, absolutely. Christine can give an update. I think you're thinking, uh, so we have the nutrient mass valve, simple mass valve, nutrient pool and water. Christine has been embarking on work for new quantifying nutrient masses in many different schools, not just water. Christine can give an update for you. Yeah, so unfortunately we had a kind of shelf up for the moment because we really wanted to focus on their salt study and like we were being away from the salt cycling and dynamics. So we anticipate seeing that nutrient cycling work up again around September and February. and then really having that creating implementation and getting the data out. So apologies on the delay there. We will be diving back in, collecting a little more data, and finishing up the data and research. Part of the funding in the agreement with ecosystems for this current fiscal year includes some funding for reporting on, on this task, and it includes funding to deploy sediment traps uh, again at a few locations, and that is work that will be done um, after the uh, spring. If you get some sediment, Gary will want it because it's probably hoop. Verify the micro. So, so my understanding was that you were sort of taking a snapshot in time, yeah. and then the idea was, as you analyze that, to take a closer look and see if we need to do more follow-up studies and maybe even more frequently. But yeah. I'm assuming there's there hasn't been any discussion around that then yet, John. Because I would definitely urge Chief let's uh, continue that work, especially uh, pending the results of 
of what USGS is seeing that I, I think it might be important. I think just the fact that um, Christine found how much nitrogen was really sequestered in those in in those uh, benthic uh, areas of the lake that were not microbialized. I thought it was very uh, telling, and we definitely didn't know that. And I'm assuming maybe more information will come from it. So I think we need to keep it close. I understand why you had to delay it, of course. Um, but when we pick that back up, I think we need to take a fresh look at that as a group and see what the importance may be to continue these studies. Okay. That'd be really exciting. And I, I can't wait to get back into it. And if we can send Gary some sediment and we can do some decomposition studies for yep. sediment, because that's really what I wanted to repeat the sediment trap, which is kind of did an estimate of what was being deposited, but we have an estimate of kind of 